Are you able to see my screen? No, sir. Can you see the screen now? I think Dr. Girish has joined as a guest. You might have to upgrade him. Already done, sir. That's a So shall I uh, share this uh, screen from my side, the presentation? From your end. Okay. Are we sir is online? Uh, Dr. Giri, sir, can should I share the should I share the screen from my side? Um give me one minute, one more attempt. Sure. Is that okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just that you have to okay. put it on a full screen. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. So let us begin. Uh, my uh, let me pay my regards to Mohan Rajapurkar, sir, and uh, let me begin uh, what I'm. I have to say here, uh, uh, sir. I I am like your grand student. So I am student of your student. So please uh, forgive me if I say something wrong here. I welcome don't, Dr. Vinan. Don't make me feel the a fossil. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Vinant. I welcome Dr. Urmila. I welcome Dr. Anila. And I start uh, talking about the Nephrocon. My, these are my two affiliations. So one is Symbiosis. One is Renowned Clinical Services. And uh, I'll just begin my talk as an introductory talk and uh, let the speakers take over after that. So this is the... You know, research and we think of academics. So these three, they come together and uh, they make us what we are today. And if we look at the time which we spend on each of these aspects in nephrology is something like, uh, uh, something like 70% patient care, just uh, some around 10% uh, for research and rest of the things for academics. Kiri, sir, you're uh, not audible. Uh, we're sorry for uh, sir, sir's uh, internet is a issue. So we'll just wait for a minute until he gets back.
Um, I think we'll just start with the next talk. And then when once sir comes back, uh, maybe sir can join us again. Uh, without much ado, um, we I just want to introduce Nephrocon on sir's behalf. Am I audible? Okay. So uh, we uh, initiated Nephrocon uh, with the plan of having a platform, one platform, an online platform for nephrologists and nephropathologists. And we've uh, decided that we'll be conducting monthly seminars uh, on first Friday of every month. So this is the first seminar and uh, I'd like to welcome our panelists, Dr. Uh, Urmila Ma'am, Dr. Anila Ma'am and Dr. Vinant Bhargar. Uh, they have um, uh, well, graced us to uh, be a participant uh, in our discussions that have been that are going to happen in the next one and a half hour of our uh, beginning. So I shall start with uh, my talk, and I need uh, Sima. You need to disable. Just one second. Yeah. Uh, am my slides visible? Yes. 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 So, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Purva Bhavikar from Aurangabad, and uh, I shall be discussing the ISN primer course in glomerular diseases, uh, the practicalities of the course. I happened to attend this course in uh, October 2023, that is last month. Uh, it was a course uh, which happened for the first time, organized by International Society of Nephrology. Uh, there were 10 uh, renal experts uh, from all over the world uh, with 170 plus delegates from different parts of the world. Uh, one second. Yeah. Um, so to begin with, uh, this is the course uh, syllabus that happened on over two days. That is day one and day two. Uh, day one, we had discussions over uh, about uh, normal histophysiology of glomerulus, the immunosuppression, minimal change disease, FSGS, membrane membranous nephropathy, then nephritic syndromes, that is proliferative uh, glomerulonephritis, IgA nephropathy, lupus nephritis, MPGN, C3 glomerulopathy. And then we discussed a few infections and in the kidneys, that is HIV, uh, COVID, hepatitis. And that was the, the day one was concluded with a clinical pathological symposium. Day two, we moved on to the RPGN, that is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, hematonephrologist uh, aspect of a plasma cell dyscreasis, amyloidosis, immunotactoid glomerulonephritis. And lastly, there was a session on onconephrology and a few uh, discussions over common hereditary glomerular diseases and TMAs. I would recommend this course uh, for uh, especially for second year nephrology trainees because that is when we actually start understanding some ABC of nephrology. So moving on. I because of uh, because this course happened over two days and it's almost next to impossible to cover so many topics uh, in 30 minutes I will be focusing just on the part A that is uh, the basics minimal change disease FSGS membranous nephropathy IgA nephropathy and lupus nephritis my disclaimer would be that uh, slides with the logo are a di direct adaptation from the course. Uh, there have been frequent references to the KDGO glomerulonephritis guidelines during the course. So uh, I, I wouldn't uh, explain each and every bit of it. It will be better if we can just uh, have the references kept in mind. Uh, my major focus would be on approaching the disease entity in routine practice rather than the theoretical aspect of glomerulonephritis. Yeah. And lastly, in case my talk has some pathologies uh, diagnosed by you, please feel free to correct me. So how do we 
uh, diagnose how do how do glomerular diseases present uh, at the outset generally speaking the spectrum of major glomerular diseases is between the nephrotic syndrome and the nephro nephritic syndrome with the major glomerular disease uh, with a variable proteinuria and hematuria when it's a podocytopathy uh, the, the predominantly we see proteinuria and when the picture is nephritic uh, we see hematuria uh, nonetheless, there are other presentations like hypertension, azotemia, oliguria, anorexia, which need to be evaluated thoroughly. So then how shall we evaluate glomerular diseases? This is the usual battery of investigations followed by almost all nephrologists to manage kidney diseases. An addition to the screening is a kidney biopsy, which makes everything clear. So when we biopsy, uh, these are the conditions that is uh, nephrotic syndrome, hematuria plus proteinuria, non-nephrotic protein, non -nephrotic range proteinuria, that is more than a gram of proteins, uh, proteinuria per day, isolated hemat hematuria. These are the clinical presentations. They can be super added with a comorbidity like uh, diabetes uh, in which biopsy is indicated. The I would also like to add unexplained azotemia for more than two weeks, which is not improving in this list. The pre-biopsy requirements are two normal size unobstructed kidneys, a blood pressure of less than 160 by 95 millimeters of mercury, sterile urine, urine culture, and a stable coagulation st status. At our center, we stop aspirin for three days prior and clopidogrel five days uh, before biopsy. In case of emergencies, we have done sono-guided uh, biopsies when the, when the patient is on aspirin. So what happens when we get the kidney biopsy report? Uh, how many of us uh, read the last line uh, and conclude that this is the diagnosis and we proceed for treatment? And how many actually discuss with the pathologist to uh, gather inf more information, clinic correlate clinically and then uh, go ahead with the treatment. So I remember during the course, one of the faculty actually mentioned that they have a roundtable meeting of a nephrologist and a pathologist before they come to a conclusion regarding the further plan of management. So I guess that would be an ideal case scenario. scenario and it would not only boost Indian literature, but will probably add more insight to the existing classifications of various glomerular diseases. So we at our hospital talk to the pathologist. When we call the pathologist, we let them give the expert comment with our clinical correlation to conclude the pathology seen in the biopsy. One must know what is normal and abnormal, and I shall explain the, these terms in the upcoming slides. So to understand glomerular diseases, uh, one must know that there are three types of glomerular cells that is mesangial cells, endothelial cells, and porocytes. The normal density of this, these cells is two is to three is to one. That is two mesangial cells is two is two mesangial cells for three endothelial cells and for one porocyte. Normally there are two mesangial cells per mesangial area. Uh, however, I tried hunting the exact definition of mesangial area and I couldn't get the exact meaning. So I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Radhika and Dr. Anila ma'am to maybe throw some light on this. One more deficiency uh, I'd like to share is that it is very easy for nephrologists to understand schematics because it's colorful, easily demarcated and looks beautiful too. But when I was a first year and I was asked to read uh, this slide, for example, the one on the left, um, I used to get lost because our HOD, Dr. Dighesar, always used to ask, please point out which is the mesangial cell, where is the capillary, uh, where is the parietal epithelium, and stuff like that. And we used to just look at each other. So everything looks the same. The porocytes, endothelium, mesangial cells, on even the, on the pastain and the HNE sometimes are confusing. Hence, uh, I have immense respect for uh, nephropathologists and that is why this forum. Nonetheless, uh, sharing some basic knowledge which I have gained over the years, 
Uh, on the right hand side of the screen is an electron microscopy picture of glomerular basement membrane. On the uh, left is a normal glomerulus. At 12 o'clock is the urinary pole, 6 o'clock the vascular pole, the rings in between the capillaries, the rings which you can see here are the capillaries, a single blue nucleus of these capillaries is the endothelium and the mesangial matrix is right here in the center. Oh, I should just, okay. Focusing on the right side again, in this image, it is a schematic, which we can understand a lot better than the real biopsy picture. So uh, we flipped the image of this EM image. And now we can see like an amoeba-like picture, amoeba-like uh, image on top uh, with hanging structure. These are the foot processes. The tentacles that of the amoeba are the foot processes. Uh, the slits in between act as a sieve for filtration. And since podocytes have a contractile ability owing to the various proteins uh, that are given, like example, actin, TRPC, uh, they can control the slit diaphragm size. So let's e elaborate some terms. These terms uh, being pro uh, focal diffuse and segmental global. I'll begin with that them first. So when you scan a slide on 10X, you can see multiple glooms. The one with the picture on top where I've labeled them as focal and diffuse. That is how you can see when the slide is focused on 10X. So predominantly when you see some pathology that is not normal, uh, happening under 10x in less than 50% of the glooms, it is called focal. And when the pathology is almost in all the glooms it's present, it is called diffuse. So some glooms is focal and all glooms are involved that is diffuse. Whereas on the other side, when you uh, change the um, uh, visualization to high power, uh, you will see one and you focus on only one glomerulus, you see a glomerular tuft. So when a part of the glomerular tuft is affected, it is segmental. And when the entire glomerular tuft is affected, it is called a global lesion. Coming to the proliferative lesion, again, referring to the schematic rather than the live pictures, uh, but the live pictures also have uh, indicate uh, obvious changes. Mesangial hypercellularity indicates that the mesangial cells, there are more than three mesangial cells per mesangial area. And endocapillary proliferation is more cells inside the endothelium. Extracapillary proliferation is more cells outside the epithelium. There could be a, like a crescentic glomerulonephritis is an extracapillary proliferation. So coming to my favorite part that is specific glomerular diseases and patterns. Thank God that uh, we have only seven mechanisms through which our kidneys can get damaged, but God forbid, uh, None of us should uh, develop any kidney disease. Uh, of the seven mechanisms, uh, three are uh, due to either due to a genetic condition or there, is, there could be a photocytopathy. Uh, then there is a circulating uh, fact there are cert circulating factors like SUPAR. And then there could be a protein deposition like amyloid. The other four could be immune mediated. That is uh, either there could be an in-situ immune complex formation like in membranous nephropathy, or there could be a deposition of already formed immune complexes like IgA nephropathy or lupus nephritis. Then there, are, there we have is an autoantibody against glomerular basement membrane that is anti-GBM antibodies. And lastly, there the injury could be due to damaged activated poly neutrophils and macrophages. So coming to nephrotic syndrome, uh, nephrotic syndrome can be primary and or secondary. The Like any other disease, secondary nephrotic syndrome can be uh, caused due to genetic, uh, sorry, can be caused due to infections, malignancy, drugs, or autoimmune conditions. Uh, 
uh, there could be a genetic cause also. But more or less, nephrotic syndrome histopathologically presents as uh, minimal change disease, focal, uh, glo focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membranous nephropathy, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, C3GN or dense deposit disease. And amyloidosis can also present as nephrotic syndrome. The hereditary causes of nephrotic syndrome that have um, uh, occurred are due to Alport syndrome, Fabry's disease, nail patella syndrome, partial lipodystrophy, and Apol-1 nephropathy. So this is uh, the picture of podocytes uh, from the course itself. You can see the arrowed ones on the left with the H and E. Uh, these are the podocytes. They anchor. If this is the capillary, they are anchoring um, the uh, capillary uh, wall. On the right hand side, you can see uh, at around 12 o'clock, you can see a podocyte uh, that is trying to have its tentacles spread over the left and right capillaries. Now, uh, podocytopathies basically occur because uh, there is a effacement of the podocytes. The tentacles spread apart, and when they spread apart, the slit diaphragm uh, size increases. If this injury or if this uh, effacement continues for a prolonged period of time, and there is a sustained injury and second hit, third hit, fourth hit, with glomerular injury ongoing, there will be irreversible podocyte stress, which will cause podocyte detachment or apoptosis. And eventually there will be glomerulosclerosis. So sometimes when we see biopsies and uh, the impression mentions focal glomerulosclerosis, it's usually end stage and it is not focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So those two terms are not to be confused. Also, the uh, podocyte, uh, the, one second. the intensity of uh, podocyte injury um, predominantly will have an effect on how the patient might land up into remission or will be either will be steroid sensitive or steroid resistant. So coming to minimal change disease. So light microscopy is almost normal, but sometimes there will be lipoid nephrosis and the tubules will show lipid laden uh, foamy uh, like structure. Um, what needs to be kept in mind is that when we see the immunofluorescence, there is a new entity, a new antibody that has been recently unraveled called antinephrine antibodies. Uh, I'll try and zoom this structure here. You can see some dusting in the uh, in this region. This dusting is called IgG dusting, and it is pathognomic of uh, minimal uh, antinephrine anti uh, antinephrine antibody related nephrotic syndrome. The the third uh, on the right hand side, the electron microscopy. You can see here there is effacement of the foot processes. And this is an interesting picture, which I'd like to focus, is that the interdigitating um, tentacles, those are the ones which are the foot processes of the podocyte. And when they start separating, the slit diaphragm uh, size increases. I have another picture, which will make it more clear. So coming to the clinical aspect, uh, Minimal change disease accounts for around 75% of nephrotic syndrome in children. The path pathogenesis is probably because of T-cell dysfunction or there is an increased glomerular permeability factor. And if, it, if the patient is steroid sensitive and has anti-nephrine antibodies, there's a, small, there's a typo here, uh, it could be B-cell related damage. And the loss of electronegative charge of the glomerular basement membrane is the uh, reason why proteinuria uh, is aggravated. The first line therapy uh, is steroids and the second line therapy is cyclophosphamide. We, I would not uh, stress more, but we can, uh, one, we should refer to the KDGO guidelines for what is the dose and how the patient is supposed to be monitored. One thing uh, about uh, 
minimal change nephrotic syndrome uh, was they studied um, tacrolimus and low dose steroid uh, and they found that it was non-inferior to conventional uh, steroid treatment in Korean uh, minimal change nephrotic syndrome patients. In fact, the relapse rates were also uh, not, sorry, the relapse rates uh, were also significantly improved with uh, no clinically relevant differences in safety. They used uh, around uh, one milligram of, uh, sorry, 0.05 milligram per kg of tacrolimus uh, given twice daily with half a milligram per kg of prednisolone. This was compared to one milligram per kg of prednisone. It was given for eight weeks or until complete remission. And two weeks later, tapering was started. So there is a benefit of low dose steroid and tacrolimus as an alternative to high dose steroids. Another, a few clinical trials have also occurred, uh, have also been done to study the effects of mycophenolate sodium or tacrolimus monotherapy. You can read about them in these uh, articles. So coming to the next uh, topic, that is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. We have uh, on the le left-hand side, we have light microscopy, which uh, shows that there is um, segmental sclerosis on the, at four o'clock. There are, the famous uh, Columbia classification that is, um, which uh, describes five variants uh, suggests that the tip variant has a good prognosis, but we discussed it at the uh, course and in our clinical practice also we find that many times when we see patients who have tip uh, lesion, we counsel them that they'll be doing extremely well and they need not worry. But then uh, eventually, let's say after eight weeks of uh, steroids or uh, the, convention, the conventional treatment, proteinuria si still seems to be there. So whether the histological pattern has any uh, significance over the prognosis or of the variant is still a gray zone and it is still being studied. But uh, it should be a word of caution that uh, tip lesion may not necessarily do well in clinical practice. In immunofluorescence, we have uh, low IgM or C3 staining in the mesangial areas. This could be sometimes, but uh, majority of the times immunofluorescence in FSGS is negative. The electron microscopy here, again, I'll just zoom in. You can see that uh, there is uh, almost loss of um, the podocyte efface, the massive podocyte effacement here. One interesting picture that I found was uh, this one, which is a focused ion beam uh, scanning, scanning electron microscopy tomography. Uh, this on the left-hand side, you can see in A, there is uh, the foot processes are interdigitating. When you see in the picture B, the foot processes interdigitation has um, got some distance in between the purple area, which you can demarcate here as to compare to this one. And in C, you can see that this uh, area has widened. So you can imagine the type of protein urea that can occur in uh, all the three uh, events from A to C. And that uh, probably uh, leads recurrent uh, sclerosis causes this kind of a picture and that will in the end uh, give rise to the massive proteinuria. Now coming to genetics of FSGS, these a lot of literature has been come in has been coming in the last ten years, and uh, I wouldn't focus a lot on this uh, the this article is worth reading, which also describes therape therapeutic trials in adult FSGS based on the genetics. The same paper mentions a new classification of FSGS where they have divided um, um, the um, histology into uh, four categories, sorry, the disease into four categories. That is presumed permeability factor related FSGS, then maladaptive FSGS where the whole nephron uh, mass is low and because of that whatever nephrons are left they uh, have hyperfiltration and then eventually uh, develop focal segmental lesions 
Then there is genetic FSGS and FSGS of undetermined cause. I'd like y'all. I'd like to point out that the recurrence rate uh, after kidney transplantation for presumed permeability factor related FSGS is high, and in India, as far as I know, I am not aware that uh, if we are doing super levels uh, on a routine basis when we are uh, transplanting primary uh, FSGS cases. The next uh, case is membranous nephropathy. It is my favorite. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see that uh, this uh, there is a Jones uh, stain and then the pass stain where we can see the glomerular basement membrane is um, uh, properly seen. And uh, we can, if I, I'll just zoom this, we can make out that there are spikes here. They... These are the spikes, which are sub-epithelial. Now, I haven't discussed this. I missed discussing this, but I'd like to show you all something which I find it easy to understand is that in, if this is the GBM and if this is the endothelium and this is the podocyte, when there is a pathology that occurs sub-epithelial, that is below the uh, glomerular basement membrane, it's more likely a nephrotic lesion. Uh, so you can see all kinds of podocytopathies. Or if the lesion is a glomerular basement membrane related, of course, it's anti-GBM disease. And if there is a rent in these endothelial cells or there is a rent in the glomerular basement membrane along with these endothelial cells, we have the nephritic picture where RBCs uh, go into the Bowman's capsule and eventually into the urine. So... Coming back to nephropathy, uh, the deposits are subepithelial, that is between the podocyte and the antiglomerular basement membrane. Now, we have in the past almost 10 years, a lot of antigens have been studied. Uh, the most studied is the plateau uh, followed by the TH7, a THS a thrombospondin uh, type, uh, thrombospondin domain type 7A. Then there is NEL1 and SEMA3B. I'd like to point out that we are, uh, of whatever biopsies we are doing and we are sending, because we have the privilege to do these antigens, we are finding a lot of NEL1. And the NEL1 that we are uh, coming across is amongst the younger population. In the West, the literature suggests that uh, NEL1 is associated with malignancies. But our patients, uh, there have been almost six patients I have seen so far. Three are uh, were published uh, uh, from KM hospital and three I've seen uh, in my hospital where we saw that uh, two of them were young females. Uh, there was no history of, um, we did not, obviously we couldn't evaluate for any malignancy because they were 32 to 34 years of age, but there was a history of fairness cream use. So, Maybe we need to still have more data and I think uh, our uh, upcoming speakers will focus on the glomerular registry. But our data does not, whatever we are seeing in clinical practice, does not really um, uh, help us understand that whether NEL1 is associated with any malignancy. Coming to the electron microscopy, um, there is the deposits in membranous nephropathy are either intramembranous or, or subepithelial. So I'll just point out, this is the glomerular basement membrane and these are the deposits, intramembranous deposits. This is subepithelial and these are the subepithelial deposits. Next, coming to membranous nephropathy clinical caveats. As I discussed earlier, we have plateauer anti uh, plateau or antibodies th s d seven a nel one sema three a uh, proctocadrin seven that is pcdh seven ncam one and exostocin one and two that is ext one and two so most of us rely on uh, testing of these antibodies and uh, the uh, sensitivity of these tests is uh, western blot remains to be um, the most accurate, the most sensitive, followed by the immunofluorescence assay, followed by ELISA. 
uh, ELISA, even with a lower cutoff value, the sensitivity remains to be low. Uh, plateau R uh, immunofluorescence assay is 100% specific and ELISA is 96% sensitive. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out here is um, when we are proceeding for transplantation in membranous nephropathy, we tend to do plateau R levels, especially for those who were plateau R when they were they, when their native kidney disease was plateau R positive. So I came across this patient where the plateau R level, levels remained to be 250, which were off the roof. And this patient had received uh, rituximab on three occasions over the past three years. And even then, when he had landed up in ESRD, uh, his plateau R levels were high. So my question to the house would be, how do we approach uh, such case, patients where um, do we still continue to use plateau uh, uh, to uh, proceed for transplantation? And if these levels are high, what is their uh, correlation uh, with recurrence? Next, um, one thing uh, that we need to know about membranous nephropathy is immunological remission occurs early. That is this graph, which you can see here, the anti-plateau anti antibodies first uh, disappear followed by the proteinuria. So let's say you have started treatment for anti uh, for uh, membranous nephropathy and the patient does not achieve remission, but you are monitoring the patient with plateauers. So you will see a decreasing trend, trend of plateauer, whereas the proteinuria will take some time for it to come down and that will eventually lead to partial remission or complete remission. Uh, also, what I need you to point out here, I, what I need to point out here is when there is uh, plateau R antibodies in the tissue, but it is serologically negative, that is probably the rising phase or the decreasing phase. At the peak of anti plateau R activity, the tissues will also be positive and the serology will also be positive. And followed by if the tissue is positive, but serology is negative, that is good news because membranous nephropathy deposits take years to disappear. And then there is remodeling of glomerular basement structure. So as a nephrologist, a word of caution would be you need to know at what point in time in this graph have you found out that the patient is having membranous nephropathy. Mm -hmm. Next, the same uh, uh, illustration, but explained in a different manner. That is Im immunological initiation starts first. Then there is zero positive preclinical phase where there is a, a autoantibody rise and the, you can see deposits also. In the active phase, you can see the anti plateauer antibodies are positive. The deposits will be positive and there will be massive proteinuria. Now, the clinical course of membranous nephropathy patients is one third of them remain to be nephrotic and then eventually become in stage renal disease. One third have remission and one third relapse after achieving a partial remission or complete remission. These are the uh, trials associated with membranous nephropathy. The gold standard uh, till date still uh, is uh, steroids and um, cyclophosphamide, the Pondicelli regimen, or the modified Pondicelli regimen. The Pondicelli regimen is, um, sorry, the modified Pondicelli regimen is, we give alternating doses of steroids and cyclophosphamide for six months, and we see the clinical course. We have uh, data about uh, rituximab being studied in membranous nephropathy. Uh, apart from this clinical trial, I'd like to uh, share my experience about a patient who was a 19-year-old boy uh, who was diagnosed to have membranous nephropathy, plateau are negative on serology as well as uh, histopathology. And he was treated with, uh, initially he was treated with steroids for six months. He achieved partial remission. Then he relapsed again. In the second relapse, uh, he developed uh, deep vein thrombosis. And in that uh, situation, he was uh, referred to, to tertiary care center and he was started on rituximab. He was given um, 500 milligrams uh, of rituximab and uh, he did not achieve uh, remission after rituximab at least three months um, of, uh, after the dose. 
After three months, he was started on tacrolimus and steroids. Even then, he could not achieve remission. Finally, when he was 24, he again developed a venous thromboembolism episode, which was taken care of in the ICU. But apart from that, he was then finally started on modified ponticelli regimen. At present, despite of uh, treating the patient with modified ponticelli, um, oral, he is on triple immunosuppression and uh, remains to have subnephrotic range proteinuria. So again, I would uh, like the house's opinion on uh, the different uh, treatment modalities for membranous nephropathy. Coming to IgA nephropathy, uh, a take-home message after the course would be that there is an IgA nephropathy uh, registry uh, of which uh, even India is a part of. In fact, um, uh, Manisha Ma'am is a part of it in the investigation uh, uh, group. So on the left-hand uh, side, um, we have the light microscopy where you can see the mesangial uh, uh, hypercellularity that is the M1 lesion of the MEST C classification of Oxford. And then below you can see endothelial, uh, sorry, endocapillary proliferation. In the immunofluorescence, uh, we can see that there is IgA deposits uh, in the mesangium. And in electron microscopy, there is mesangial hypercellularity electron dense deposits can be seen. So IgA apparently uh, coming from Dr. John Barrett himself um, is not the same all over the world. What we see in India may be a completely different picture from what they see in UK or what they do in the United States. So maybe our disease even we might have come across many patients who some population of IgA nephropathy do extremely well on uh, ACE inhibitors and the others land up in, in stage renal disease within five years or even three years of uh, diagnosis. So in this situation, it is recommended when we have a registry and uh, we also have that calculator which is uh, for prognostication and risk factor for IgA nephropathy. Uh, it is a tool that is available and it asks to, you just have to feed in how many gloms were seen, the MEST C classification uh, score system, the blood pressures, the proteinuria present and uh, the time of biopsy. And you can know the at what is the risk of the patient developing end-stage renal disease. Also, I need we need to uh, uh, emphasize on country-specific screening programs and renal biopsy practices. There is a possibility, like in this situation, um, the whole gamut of the way we have MCD at one end and FSGS at the other, uh, there could be a possibility of HSC, HSP at one end and IgA nephropathy at the other. Nonetheless, these are the clinical presentations of I IgA nephropathy and henoschronlein purpura in relation to age. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. That is, uh, there is a genetic element and then there is infection. Then there, uh, because of which there is immune dysregulation and galactose deficient IgA1, that is GD IgA1 deposits occur in the mesangium and there is formation of IgA immune complexes. So IgA nephropathy treatment, um, there is um, the foundation of optimized kidney care is uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors like uh, the glyphosins, uh, endothelin receptor antagonists, and uh, mineral, min finrinone is another drug that can uh, help uh, being an antiproteinuric in IgA nephropathy. Uh, also, in cases where the EGFR is preserved and is above 60, we can use glucocorticoids and complement inhibitors. Um, we uh, have a new molecule that is being st well studied in the past five years. That is the nephigan or uh, budesonide, which is uh, which acts on the Peyer's patches and which is specific for uh, IgA nephropathy. Uh, one more clinical caveat that uh, I learned when I was doing the course was, uh, my question was that, uh, how do you manage the recurrence of IgA nephropathy after kidney transplant? Let's say we do not know the native kidney disease uh, of a patient. And we have a few cases where five years or six years later, 
the uh, the biopsy proven IgA is present in the kidney biopsy. In such cases, uh, it is recommended that instead of giving them glucocorticoids, which is like five milligrams or ten milligrams of prednisone, this is equal to nine milligrams of butyrosonide. So the clinical caveat would be sorry the uh, recommendation would be that you can switch these glucocorticoid patients to giving them butyrosonide in case there is a recurrence after kidney transplantation. Now, ATG induction lowers the risk of recurrence and there is increased risk of uh, recurrent IgA nephropathy if you're using a steroid free or you're withdrawing the steroids from uh, after transplantation. And uh, if it is a zero HLA mismatched living related donor, even then the chances of developing a recurrence of IgA are high. This is on the right hand side, you can see that uh, this is the process that occurs after transplantation. That is uh, mesangial IgA deposits will occur first then there will be there will be no hematuria, but patient uh, microscopic hematuria can be present. After microscopic hematuria, patient will develop proteinuria and then progressive allograft failure, finally landing up in transplant um, in stage renal disease. Now coming to lupus nephritis, it is uh, quite a vast topic, and I think I'll do uh, injustice if I just limit myself. To two to three slides. So we are we have planned another session of lupus nephritis in the month of January or February, where we will discuss this a bit more in detail. However, uh, on the left hand side you can see uh, class two, uh, class three, class four lesions of lupus nephritis. The most dreaded lesions are class three and class four. The interesting question: what the nephrologist needs to know is. Let's say a patient is an established case of SLE presents to you with proteinuria. You want, what would be your next step? You would want to know what class of lupus nephritis he or she, she, he or she has. Now, let's say the case is already an established case of lupus nephritis. And now the patient comes to you after two years of being in remission. What do you do next? The answer is rebiopsy because you want to know whether the class has whether the class has changed from class three to class four or class two to class three or class three to class five. It could be anything. Apart from uh, a relapse, sorry, apart from switch in the class, there could be other causes of proteinuria in lupus nephritis patients that also need to be ruled out. Lupus nephritis. For immunofluorescence, we see a full house pattern that is IgM, IgG, IgA, C1Q, C3, Kappa, Lambda, all will be positive. Coming to the electron microscopy, um, you can see large fine granular deposits in the mesangial region and the prominent, prominent fine glomerular subepithelial deposits here. Coming to a personal uh, recommendation of Dr. Adrian. He is uh, one of the members of the working group of KDGO, KDGO Glomerular Nephritis 2021 guidelines. So he his practice is that in case the patient uh, has rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis or crescentic lupus nephritis or very severe histopathological features with high risk of chronic changes, and severe extra renal SLE manifestations like cerebral lupus, uh, he prefers to give pulse uh, dose of methylprednisone, that is 0.5 to 1 gram per day for three days. For patients who have do not have a severe disease and but have active histopathological changes, uh, he recommends uh, starting them on MMF 500 milligrams twice daily, maximum dose up to 1 gram. And they, he has gone up to three grams per day for those who are tolerating a high dose. And finally, for older patients or patients with RPGN or patients who have compliance issues, cyclophosphamide is given as a uro lupus protocol. IV cyclophosphamide, 500 milligrams fortnightly for three months. Maintenance phase, um, uh, maintenance of uh, maintenance therapy for lupus nephritis. Uh, if the patient requiring induction with IV cyclophosphamide and MMF in class 4 lupus nephritis 
or highly active class three, uh, we maintain with MMF for at least one year and taper over the next two years. Mild class three lupus nephritis, MMF and azathioprine are an option. Azathioprine when you, the cost is an issue and pregnancy is planned. Steroid dosing, uh, we should aim at five milligrams per day within a year of maintenance. Prolonged low dose versus withdrawal uh, is patient and disease dependent. Adjuvant therapies are uh, RAS inhibitors, statins and HCQS. Pregnancy in lupus nephritis, um, it is recommended that we counsel to avoid pregnancy when the disease is active or the teratogenic drugs are ongoing for more than six months after lupus nephritis becomes inactive. Uh, HCQS is to, supposed to be continued during pregnancy as it is pregnancy safe. Low dose of aspirin should be started before 16 weeks of gestation. Other drugs that are pregnancy safe for lupus nephritis are uh, glucocorticoids, azathioprine, tacrolimus, and cyclosporine. Um, last a word about lupus nephritis. He, if you can master lupus nephritis, you will reach nirvana in renal pathology, glomerulonephritis, immunosuppression, pregnancy, autoimmune kidney, autoimmunity, and kidney disease and kidney replacement. Coming to my last uh, topic, that is immunosuppressants. I wouldn't uh, go into the detail of each, but overall, um, for uh, managing nephrology, uh, glomerular disease pa uh, patients or disease, we use glucocorticoids, uh, CNIs, uh, that is cyclosporin and tacrolimus, anti-metabolites, uh, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, eculizumab, and avacopan. Eculizumab at present is not available in India, at least in Maharashtra. Uh, I'm not aware if it is available in any other part of the country. Uh, the infection risk um, we need to be careful about. <laughs> and um, prophylaxis is supposed to be given for glucocorticoids, antimetabolites, and cyclophosphamide to prevent uh, pneumocystis carinae infections, Jirovaki infections. Uh, these, this is the group of uh, Indians who attended the glomerular disease course. And uh, that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Purva. Very comprehensive talk. And I think we have Dr. Giri, sir, back with us. So Yes, yes, I'm back. Yes, sir. So I'll just uh, try and share my screen here. Yes. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will go to the... I'll go to the PowerPoint uh, slide mode. So am I audible and am I visible? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. And uh, now I have shifted to my daughter's laptop. So I think things will go now smoothly. Uh, <laughs> there won't be any disconnections now. So I'm here just to talk about uh, what is nephrocon. Okay, wh why we have coined this word and what it is all about. So in coming slides, uh, I'll just tell you what the nephrocon, what we are trying to do. So this is the wheel of nephrology where my, uh, where, where we have three pillars of nephrology. We do patient care, we do research and we do academics. And uh, most of us devote time in this proportion. 70% of time we do patient care, we see patients, we treat them. Uh, academics, 20%, we go to conferences, we do webinars. And uh, research is 10%. But most of us, we aspire to do more research and more academics. And we just want to transform our day's work to something like this. 50% patient care, 25% research and 25% academics. But these 25% devoted in research and academics are actually increasing the quality of patient care that we are doing day in and day out. That this is all, of, this is, this is all about enhancing the patient care uh, at the end of the day and how do we do that how do we do research we do research with money what we want is money but not this money 
these are old currency notes these do not work in research so what works in research is data so data is the currency of 21st century we need data we need metadata and we, we need super data what we call it as super data because it is something translational in value and this is how we want to enhance the research and uh, how do we do that so we do need some research collecting tools and these tools are simple surveys simple observations we put down as case reports or case studies we do interviews we interview the patients we interview the families we do focus group discussions like what we are doing right now and we use all this data so we collect the data we compile the data and we analyze the data and this is what it all about so this is how we do it we acquire the data we need data acquisition tools then we analyze the data and then we apply it bedside so the research is having a translational value from bedside from from the bench side so we are moving away from the bench we are going nearer to the bed we need to do research which has a translational value next will be uh, what are the challenges in research so the, the, every step in research is a challenge so we we have to prepare a study protocol that is a challenge we have to ap protocol approvals from various organizations like say dcgis uh, icmr dbt dsts and our ethics committees which are definitely in our institutions then we need sponsor somebody to look after the research then we need to do data acquisition with the help of clinical research coordinators and and then we go for a trial study and then we prepare a manuscript and then we publish it so all these stages which which take place in a research in nephrology will definitely be one challenge at one step but this can be addressed by various academic activities like this what we are doing today the webinars we do them regularly or we do them occasionally that that is that is how we uh, how we gonna figure it out but what we identify are the knowledge gaps so what purva presented was an excellent account of all the knowledge she has gathered in one group meeting but there are knowledge gaps and we have to identify these knowledge gaps we are fill in the knowledge gaps and what will be benefited will be the clinical output the clinical clinical output through every knowledge gap being filled in and that will have the real translational value and these knowledge gaps or these bundles of knowledge gaps we need to disseminate and the dissemination will happen in conferences in webinars in closed door meetings and our daily interactions with our colleagues so this is what will enhance our patient care so we need to we need to begin we need to begin somewhere that is the humble beginning in 2023 we are beginning as an ephrocon that will be just be a platform for all these activities to happen and so we'll have three pillars one will be the research second is patient care and third will be academic so if you look at the nephrocon do you think it is mentoring no 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 nothing nothing mentoring here we are here just to become a facilitator so the facilitation can be uh, uh, creating protocols designing protocols helping out researchers and nephrologists for taking approvals from the bodies finding good sponsors or funding them on their own sumoto so this will be an initiative by the nephrologists for the nephrologists so this is all about i have to say today and uh, i won't dwell into uh, the that intricacies of uh, uh, of research in nephrology but i just want to make an humble beginning here with uh, all the support and blessings from all of you uh, i would like to stop here and uh, and uh, give and hand over to seema ji to uh, to move ahead in the presentation thank you so much for your presentation listening thank you we will get to get back to the questions at the end of the session thank you i'll stop sharing here Okay, so thank you so much, sir. So with this, we are now moving ahead with our next talk. Uh, and I would like to welcome and invite Dr. Krishna Patil, sir. Uh, Dr. Krishna Patil currently is a consultant nephrologist and transplant physician at the Kim's Hospital, Hyderabad. Uh, he's a recipient of the research grant for Southeast Asia from the International Society of Nephrology in 2012-13, uh, then recipient of the research grant from the West Bengal State Department of Science and Technology 
He's been, he has screened more than 10,000 school children for hypertension and urinary abnormalities, fellowship in clinical nephrology from University of Ottawa, fellowship of American Society of Nephrology in 2015. So I'll invite and welcome, sir. Good evening, uh, everyone. So without wasting any time, I uh, go to the case. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, they are visible. Yeah. So uh, I'm presenting uh, a case of a middle-aged 49-year-old female uh, who is non-diabetic, hypertensive, and hypothyroid, who had an episode of accelerated hypertension in 2020 when her creatinine was detected at uh, as 1.2, was not evaluated for hypertension or any renal abnormality. And in 2022, two years later, she presented in ER with uh, generalized tonic-clonic uh, seizures. She did not have any fever, trauma, past history of GTCS or any focal neurological deficit. She didn't have any physical signs or symptoms pointing towards any systemic connective tissue disorder or vasculitis without any history of any preceding infection. She has been uh, mentioning about some poor in, or, uh, oral intake Blood pressure control had worsened over the last six months with some on and off pedal edema and shortness of breath. Uh, she was admitted to ICU. GTCS was managed. It was found that she had a creatinine of 11. Uh, dialysis was initiated. These were her labs. Uh, significant anemia, mild thrombocytopenia, uh, severe renal dysfunction. Calcium of 8.2, albumin 3.3, magnesium normal. Urine analysis, 1 plus albumin, RBC is 30, Pascal's 14. A 24-hour urine protein of uh, 1,050 milligram. Viral screen, negative. Uh, ANA, anti-DS, DNA, negative. A low C3 with normal C4. ANCA, negative. Ultrasound showing normal size kidneys with grade two renal parenchymal changes. CT brain was normal and ECO showed uh, a pical IVS uh, hypokinetic with EF 62%. She was, <clears throat> so uh, here the clinical differentials where she had cl uh, clearly come with hypertension and uh, uh, seizures with a creat of 11. So uremic with or without a hypertensive encephalopathy, subnephrotic proteinuria with a renal dysfunction. It, it could be a RPRF versus an AKA on CKD with such a significant anemia. So the possible uh, differentials that we had kept were a post-infectious GN considering a low C3 with a normal C4 or an atypical HUS uh, with such a significant anemia, some mild thrombocytopenia there with a low C3 and MPGN. There could also be some uh, dual double pathologies. So other things also need to be ruled out. And uh, so she was dialyzed uh, with five inuit PRBCs transfused. She developed an acute coronary syndrome, non estelation MI, which was medically managed with anti uh, platelets and heparin. After two weeks, she developed a catheter-related bloodstream infection. And all these events, one after the other, led to a delay in her uh, renal biopsy. The delay was by four weeks. And then a kidney biopsy was done. Uh, over to Dr. Radhika for discussing the biopsy. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, I welcome ma'am over here. Uh, Dr. Radhika Krishna Patil, ma'am, uh, she is a director and consultant nephropathologist at the Sri Balaji Diagnostics, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, she's current vice president of the Basic Sciences of Indian wow. Society of Organ Transplantation and an ex-consultant at Yashoda Hospital and Star Hospitals, Hyderabad. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, 
Yeah. Good evening, dear all and the respected faculty. Happy to be pa part of this Neprocon meet. So we received the biopsy uh, and this is a PA stain, periodic acid skip stain. Uh, this is renal capsule and this is the uh, subcapsular cortex. The, these three ball-like structures are the glomeruli and this is tubular interstitium. So this is a 4X scanner view. Here we can appreciate again few more ball-like structures, glomeruli, and the tubular interstitium is showing some loss of brush border. There are some PS positive highline cars uh, giving the uh, evidence of tubular injury. Uh, here we can see just see that this is PS positive uh, glomerulus, and there is something PS negative extra capillary proliferation that is the crescent going on. Uh, again, uh, the biopsy core, this is showing us completely globally sclerosed glomerulus and some uh, mild IFTA uh, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. Again, here uh, we can see there is an arteriole and beside that at four o'clock position, this is a remnant of a uh, crescent, only extracapillary uh, parietal epithelial cells we can see here. So, uh, there is an ischemic glomerulus also. And here are some uh, red cell casts in the tubules. And a uh, few tubules were showing uh, this luminal calcification, giving again the uh, evidence of tubular injury. So, coming to H and E stain, and this is a 40x, uh, sorry, 20x uh, lens, and it is showing a glomerulus. This is hypercellular. And uh, it is showing um, uh, enlargement of the size. How do we decide the size of a glomerulus under the microscope? That it is two and a half times size of the proximal convoluted tubule. So if it is more than that, uh, then it is called as hypercellular. Or if it is not fitting under the 40x lens, uh, high power, then, uh, then we can call it hypercellular. So this is uh, enlarge. Uh, so this is, sorry, that is enlargement. The uh, normal uh, size is two and a half times of the proximal convoluted tubule. And this is more than that and also not fitting under the 40x5 power. And here we can see there uh, this capillary lumina, they are obliterated. Uh, there are some cells. So there is definitely endocapillary hypercellularity, mesangial hypercellularity, and there is extracapillary hypercellularity also. Uh, mesangial hypercellularity we can see in PAS stain, th that is a special stain. And in between two capillary lumina, there is mesangium. And in heptin style, under the BANF uh, criteria, all those uh, 13 uh, to 14 categories, uh, there is a uh, last line is given that MM1 is that more than two cells in the mesangium is mesangial widening, that is uh, up to three cells. And more than three cells in the mesangium is mesangial hypercellularity. So here there was nothing like that. It is just endocapillary hypercellularity obliterating the capillary lumina. And uh, this is a silver stain, which is showing a, a cellular crescent and the remnant of the tuft. The tuft is hardly visible, but still we can appreciate there is a basement membrane thickening and duplication along with the mesangial cell interposition. Uh, so it was empigean kind of pattern, though there was not uh, so evident of this lobular accentuation of the tuft, but this there was a, a basement membrane thickening and duplication along with this mesangial cell interposition. Uh, also, uh, how we see the bas basement membrane thickening is that the uh, thickening is matching with the atrophic tubular basement membrane thickness. And as a protocol, uh, so this was empigean pattern also with crescents. There were out of 20 glomeruli, 11 glomeruli were showing crescents, uh, diffuse cellular crescents were there. Congo red, this is under the um, uh, by, uh, polarized micro, uh, polarization, which is not showing any uh, apple green or any reddish birefringence. Uh, so that was negative for amyloid. Uh, then immunofluorescence uh, was showing IgG positivity along the peripheral capillary loops, uh, that is capillary lumina and in the mesangium that, that, that was uh, coarse granular positivity and why here it is not because this is a crescent and extra capillary stains do not take the st uh, stain that's how we can differentiate it is a crescent on the immunofluorescence and C3C was also strongly positive so IgG C3C uh, were positive 
and kappa was 2 plus and lambda was totally negative. So the difference of 2 plus we can take it as restriction. So this was IgG uh, C3C kappa uh, positive and uh, kappa was restricted. So the diagnosis was given uh, as proliferative glomerular nephritis with monoclonal IgG kappa deposits, that is PGNMID kappa. And uh, there was a pattern of injury was MPGN pattern of glomerular nephritis with crescents, uh, diffuse crescents. Uh, there were uh, focal global glomerular sclerosis and mild IFTA along with some tubular injury and mild arteriosclerosis. And the chronicity score was given as three bar 10. Uh, Chronicity score is given uh, into four categories like uh, glomerular sclerosis, then uh, IFTA, that is uh, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis and arteriosclerosis. So for each thing, less than 25%, 25, uh, five, uh, 20 up to 50%, then more than 50%, one, one, one each. And for uh, that, that becomes nine. And then for arteriosclerosis, there, uh, it's one and two. Uh, so when uh, if it is the th intimal fibrosis thickening is less than the thickness of the media, it is one. And when it is uh, sorry zero, and when it is more than uh, the thickness of the media, then it is given as score one. So like that, the ten scoring out of which it is mild score three. And ancillary studies was congruent stain is negative for amyloidosis. Uh, this is the pattern uh, that is uh, Sanjeev City et al. They have given for the uh, reporting of MGRS. There is a recent paper uh, in C. Jackson, uh, which is uh, showing uh, this uh, light microscopic pattern in pigeon MID, uh, in which this diffuse uh, diffuse crescentic pattern was seen in only 2% of their uh, 46 cases. So there is one more entity is now uh, recognized. It was uh, given in KI reports that pigeon MID uh, uh, LC, that is light chain variant only, in which we can see only uh, C3C along with uh, one of the uh, restricted light chain and definitely we have to do proness digestion or, or paraffin immunofluorescence to see whether this IgG or any uh, heavy chain is a uh, mast uh, and then we have to uh, conclude that it is just uh, it is not mast and uh, PGNMID LC is there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I think we'll take the questions at the end. And uh, so with this, uh, I would like to now welcome and invite our next speaker, Dr. Suhas Monde. So uh, excuse me. Uh, this presentation is in two parts. The uh, just a minute. If, uh, if you want uh, the, 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 the second part of the discussion about the case, about the treatment and the follow-up, I can continue. Otherwise, we can, uh, due to limitation of time, we can uh, go to the next speaker. It depends on the panelists what they uh, like to. I think you should continue, please. That's fine. I think we continue and finish it up quickly so that uh, okay. we can finish up the questions and then the panelists can give their points and take the questions. So, so, yeah, so the diagnosis after the biopsy was a crescentic glomerulonephritis uh, PG and MID. Uh, more than 50% of the glomeruli had crescents. Uh, so this uh, entity, although uh, not very uncommon, it is uh, a challenging diagnosis with dialysis requiring chemotherapy and this patient who uh, needed a bone marrow biopsy to rule out multiple myeloma after having gone through multiple uh, challenges of uh, non-ST elevation MI and a catheter related bloodstream infection was completely reluctant for a bone marrow examination and not even willing to go for a, a oncology consultation and I was uh, I was faced with the challenge of managing her on myself. So how do we investigate such cases of PGNMID? Uh, we do the, uh, we look at the serum immuno, uh, monoclonal proteins 
by doing serum protein electrophoresis and quantify it with immunofixation, do free light chain assays to look at the clonality of the uh, cells, whether they are, it is the plasma cells, clonal plasma cells or the B cells. We look at the bone marrow aspirate and biopsy for immunohistochemistry with markers like CD138, which are plasma cell markers, CD20, which are B cell markers. Staining for kappa and lambda light chains uh, should be performed to demonstrate that uh, an identified clone exhibits the same light chain restricted as the monoclonal deposits in the kidney. Cytogenetics with fish can help in uh, risk categorization and choosing the uh, chemotherapy. So in this case, because we did not have a bone marrow examination, we did a, a, a PET scan uh, to rule out any bony lytic lesions and whether it is MGRS versus a, a multiple myeloma. So uh, the PET scan did not show any bony lytic lesions. Now here, without the uh, bone marrow examination, we cannot say it is multiple myeloma because we the, the first criteria is to have more than 10% per, uh, of plasma cells in bone marrow with one of the CRAB that is hypercalcemia, renal involvement, anemia, or uh, the bone involvement. Uh, in any case, this was a uh, case where we need to treat it. And what we, uh, how do we manage this patient is first is look at what is the clone detected in bone marrow examination, whether it's a plasma cell. If it's a plasma cell uh, clonality, then botezomib-based therapy, botezomib with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. If it's a B-cell clone, then it should be a rituximab-based, either rituximab alone or with, uh, again, the dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide. If there are no clones detected in the bone marrow, based on the serum or urine monoclonal protein detected, whether it's a non-IgM or an IgM, if it's a non-IgM, that is, uh, uh, we consider it as a plasma cell uh, clonality and bortezomib-based therapy is used. If it's an IgM detected in the, uh, mo as the monoclonal protein, then rituximab-based therapy. If there are no clones detected and there are no monoclonal proteins in the serum or urine, but it's only in the kidney that we have seen uh, this restriction, then uh, <clears throat> based on uh, the non-IgM or the IgM deposits in the kidney are based on the renal dysfunction, presence of renal dysfunction and the degree of proteinuria, we can decide treatment. If there is more than one gram proteinuria and renal dysfunction, it should be treated with immunosuppression, either with rituximab weekly doses, four doses for IgM deposits or bortezomib for non-IgM deposits or switch the therapy if one therapy fails. If there is no renal dysfunction and the proteinuria is less than one gram, we can continue to conservatively manage these patients with BP control, ACA, anti-proteinuric measures for three months with monthly monitoring of SPEP and UPEP. And if no response or worsening, then start with the chemotherapy. Monitoring is with SPEP or SIFE with uh, monthly monitoring of these uh, with these tests. 24-hour urine collection for total protein electrophoresis and immunofixation, free light chain assays, and serum creatinine. Once the six months of therapy is completed, after completing the active treatment, then uh, these tests are done every three months. Some monoclonal proteins that are initially undetectable may become detectable later in the course of disease. So we keep monitoring them, do a surveillance three months. If the, the patient has now become an end-stage kidney disease, then uh, need not be treated unless they have an extra renal uh, manifestation or they are candidates for kidney transplantation. In my case, she had M band present. The, it was a IgG and Kappa, which was matching with the deposit seen in the kidney. The free light chain ratio was 4.7 with the free Kappa more than 100 and the beta to microglobulin was high. PET scan was negative. So she was a, a MGRS and total uh, six cycles of chemo bortezomib based because it was a non-IgM monoclonal protein was given along with chemo prophylaxis for uh, PCP and antiviral. Follow up in the follow up, she continues to be dialysis dependent. She has not recovered because of the delay in treatment with an aggressive crescentic GN despite of not having so much chronicity 
such pgnm id if not treated in time can lead to esrd the reason we have treated her uh, is now uh, she has agreed after completing 6 months of therapy for bone marrow examination and bone marrow now doesn't show any plasma cells so she has attained uh, or maybe she did not have any clones there in pgnm id uh, around 40% you do not see any b cell or uh, plasma cell clones 40% you don't have monoclonal proteins as well and uh, this case uh, pgnm id treated adequately now can also have be a candidate for a renal transplant because the bone marrow doesn't show once they have achieved complete remission she can go for transplant as transplant uh, uh, it can be a, a viable option such for such patients who do not have any bone marrow uh, things or or there are no uh, multiple myeloma criteria thank you very much thank you so so uh, so with this we are now moving ahead with our next speaker uh, i would like to welcome and <laughs> dr suhas monde uh, who is a consultant nephrologist at the urukul uh, hospital pune a dnb general medicine from pune hospital then a dnb nephrology in care hospital from hyderabad uh, a fellowship in solid organ transplantation uh, from three uh, universities that is university of canada then the diploma of the royal college of physicians and surgeons of canada and the affiliation to the american society of transplant a uh, fellowship in glomerulonephritis from university of ottawa canada fellowship in clinical nephrology from university of western ontario london and canada hemodialysis fellowship uh, london nephrology department so has been associated with the international society of nephrology courses uh, a clinical nephropathology certificate course and of course an advanced uh, clinical nephropathology certificate course in transplant and oncogenephrology so over to you sir uh, to discuss on glomerular disease registry initiative thank you so much after this all wonderful um, lectures i'll be presenting something which has been more need of our as of now sorry for my voice um, my apologies respected panelists and all the colleagues who are joined from different parts of the world i bring my greetings from europol hospital pune uh, for this presentation i am not having any um, disclosures uh which is regarding the finances or any conflict of interest which is presented in this material uh to start with this is registry obviously it has to start with the very difficult definition the definition starts like application of capturing managing providing access to the condition specific information for the list of patients to support the organized care but what it means it means that we need to get a data first as dr girish was mentioning in his talk regarding the data collection once we get the data data in any sort in various aspects about the patient the patient's background the previous histories the comorbidities the patient's treatment the outcomes everything the complications which occur during the patient's treatment everything and this data once we can get it we have to understand what things we can make better to help the outcomes uh, so that we can treat the patients in a better way first of all that's what nothing but is a quality improvement the second which will be there that the same data which we can use to understand the this is itself in a much detailed way regarding the etiopathology the different mechanisms the mechanisms which are not yet established and this all we can use for the research purpose which will give us the better outcomes better treatment plans better monitoring systems for the patient the data can also give us a understanding whether the treatment which we gave was whether it was efficient or not so that if the data was if the data says that the outcomes of the patients who were treated with such and such way the outcomes are not good that means the treatment was not efficient we have to find out the treatment in a better way so that which we can help the patients in a better way and we also have need to understand that how in a easier and a better way that we can help the patients so that we can monitor the disease in a stages and outcomes so that the progression of ckd can be withheld and this all is something which we have to do it in our scenario so there are guidelines 
material available from across the world, but that has to help us in our clinical scenario. I have been part of the Canadian GN registry when I was in Ottawa, but the scenario over there is not the same what we are facing here. After, in the last one year, I realized that whatever patients I am having here, the decisions are not that easy what we used to have it in Canada or Ottawa. Sometimes we are in a catch-22 situation even for the smallest possible disease. And this needs, as I said, the data from the India or like from our hometown so that we will be able to take the patients better care. We need to find out the, what better treatment is. Nowadays, if you see that, for example, the rituximab being used for most of the glomerular diseases, but here in India, when we are giving rituximab, we are facing more challenges like infections, UTIs, even the UTI being the one of the major comorbidities for the patients who previously received rituximab, which I realized after coming and last one year of practice over here. So I understand that if we can get the data about the glomerular patients here, their establishments, their background, their treatment plans, then we'll be able to provide a guideline in a better way so that we'll be able to treat them in a much easier and much safer way. We also need to find out that when we, we are using the trials or the guidelines, we most of the time using the um, probably the same data which is being used in the Western, but that may not be the scenario which we always see. And to explain this, the, the, the outcomes of the Western population or Western data is such a luring that we need to like happen to accept it as what it is. But it may not be the same throughout. We assume that whatever findings we are getting, that might be the resembling the same, but it may not be the exact same. So suppose the Mona Lisa, if you are I'm assuming from Western data, the Mona Lisa, what I might be seeing at my home place might not be the same. And that's something which I need to uh, ask the each and every of one of us that whether we need to have a better platform where we need to get a data from our own country, our own place, and put it together to find our best possible outcomes and best possible uh, patient care, which we can offer to our patients. There is some data from the US. They have started their GN registry from 1980. But even though if you look at their major trials, lupus, um, then IgA, FSGS, the sample size is not that great. The sample size is something which we can definitely try and like compare. But the effective data collection, the electronic medical record, the way they try to get the data from the patient, the social workers from their infrastructure, pharmacy, labs, is something that will help to generate the more uh, effective, productive data, which definitely gives more answers for the questions in my mind. There are some pros about the GN registry. One of them is that we'll be able to understand the course of Indian patients, the progression of our condition. The other day I was discussing with one of you saying that the FSGS, even though it says that tip lesion has to improve so fast, but one of my patients is not improving. Why? Whether the diagnosis needs to be revisited, whether I need to talk to my nephropathologist, whether I need to consider some other treatment, whether I need to give the realistic number to my patients to explain them that condition. It's not only the understanding of the condition, it's also the comorbidity burden. The infection, what we see, is not the same what the Western or the European data says. Infection in the form of tuberculosis, how often we see our patients getting the malignancy workup done. My patients don't they get that regularly. And I am worried about the missing of any malignancies when I treat with them for any immunosuppression. For vaccines, I've seen that even though patients have been on treatment, they have not been vaccinated for long. I have seen that the need of our patients needing the anticoagulation is not the same as the Western. The number of the DVTs or the episodes of thrombotic events in Western population is exuberantly high as compared to what we see over here. So obviously there are some guidelines which we need to understand, but there are some guidelines which we need to rephrase so that we'll be able to take better care of our patients. There is a near treatment data, but whether that data or that treatment is affordable to our patient is again a question because here, even if we 
start considering the minimal possible immunosuppression for our patients. The first thing in mind of the patient is about finances. They are not covered by most of them by insurance. Most of them are paying by their own pocket. So we need to have an effective treatment and that also with pocket friendly. Now what is the good part is that even the individual practitioners are using electronic medical data in the form of their own clinics and OPDs are having softwares where the health plagues or doctors OPD where they can keep a data, keep a record of that and which we can utilize or which we can combine together all of us so that we can be able to generate the good outcome out of it. In the cons, I'm not saying that the path will be easy. Obviously, as Dr. Girish also mentioned that we need to have a ethical committee at our each setup, our each hospital to, to ascertain this. We need that data to be collected in a uniform way where we, where we can have the same uh, things to be looked at so that we can collect that data and generate some outcome out of it. Again, when we are collecting a data, we need to think about how that data is protected and how we will be able to store it. Even nowadays, earlier there was a challenge of having the data in which format to be collected. Nowadays, at least we can have online or like cloud-based server where we will be having the data storage and that will be now an easier way as compared with the previous times. The type of studies, obviously, here when we will be able to answer the question or a GN condition, suppose IGN nephropathy or FSGS, we need to decide that initially when we are all together, whether we'll be able to put something like a, like a retrospective or an observational-based study or something where we'll be able to have like a prospective, where, where we'll be having a randomized group where which will be able to guide us throughout our guidelines. We also need to understand that how we'll be able to generate the funding for him because nothing will go without funding. It will not last longer. If we need to take it far, we need to decide that how we'll be able to generate the fundings so that we'll be able to continue these efforts. We are having good clinical skills. We In India, nowadays, there is like a medical tourism. We, people are coming from across the world. I'm at a place where we get patients from US, Canada, Europe, Middle East, to be getting treated for their conditions. So definitely we are a center of excellence, but along with that, we are also having a huge data. The only thing is that we need to collect that data so that we will be able to analyze it. Once we'll be able to analyze it, we'll be able to have that Eureka moment where we'll be able to answer many, many questions. Uh, the survey sheet is not too different. It's not that it needs a very, minute data or very in-depth analysis, but it needs to be started at somewhere where we'll be able to get a background patient's uh, comorbidities, what was the biopsy, how it was treated, how was the outcome. And once we need to put it together, we'll be able to guide it in a better way. This is not too long. This is from CJS in 2016, where someone was trying to understand that to get a GN registry, how difficult it is, where the pharma company, where the hospitals, universities needs to be together and continue doing hardships just to understand that how the effective and the better treatment can be offered to the patients. They also face the hurdles. It's not only we, it's, and it's not too old also, it's just 2016. There was a Spanish GN registry which was started in 2020, Canadian started in 2018. So it's not too like far. We are still in a good way where we can start it together. I wanted to show a paper which was studied in like pulmonary fibrosis in anchor vasculitis, a series of 49 patients contributed by 26 nephrologists. So it's not something that I'm saying that it's difficult. It's just that even there is a pop, like a attendance of 72 listeners today. So if even one of us can contribute one patient, we'll be having a very good data where we'll be able to understand it, analyze it, and we'll be able to get something good out of it. There are previously uh, done trials in India. This, this is the ICMR uh, study where out of 98 trials which were done in nephrology from 2012, only 11 are there in the glomerular nephrology. So out of which three are lupus, seven are nephrotic syndrome, most of which are pediatric nephrotic syndrome, and only two of them from membranous nephropathy. The previously, even the groups have come together and formed a like a source where the study and the data collection for the glomerulonephritis can be done. 
it's not the first one but what we are seeing it's just again the mona lisa in the parts where we need to see in a whole there are many many stalwarts in the nephrology who are coming together and asking for the gn registry but we all need to come together put our efforts together and find out and obviously the nephrocon is just one of them so i'm all open for discussion criticism and thank you so much for having me here thank you swar that was a great great account so uh, <clears throat> if uh, seema allows us can we start some questions yes sir uh, okay so i'll start the ball rolling my first question is to dr vinan uh, we just uh, heard a case of uh, para proteinemia dr krishna uh, gave us a very great account so what is your take on uh, extra corporeal removal of this para proteins uh, do you how, how frequently you do in your practice and uh, how is your take on the outcomes like i'm not talking about the treatment outcomes i am talking about the patient outcomes like so what what's your comment on it yeah first of all uh, dr girish i was expecting that question from you it has to come extra corporeal has to come from you that's one thing second of all i would like to congratulate uh, organizers of nephrocon i think this has been quite a uh, quite a good 90 minutes that we've had here in which uh, we've had discussions from uh, nephrologists and pathologists coming back to your questions about extra corporeal management in uh, patients who have a plasma cell dyscrasias uh, fortunately or unfortunately for the patients we have uh, good uh, therapies uh, monoclonal antibodies available right now and hence what has happened is that uh, we cannot justify the use uh, in the present day literature considering the present day literature of using extra corporeal therapies for removal of either light chains or heavy chains in terms of a re in terms of a literature guided uh, uh answer to this kind of a question we we have used a couple of uh, uh we've done plasma exchanges a uh, couple of years back when there was some data on use of plasma exchange but unfortunately none of our patients actually did uh, benefit from it and then we've also used uh, other filters like theralite uh, like the theralite filters we've used uh, heavy chain removing filters but unfortunately at there are two road blocks here that we see one road block is the fact that most of these filters are uh, economically not viable for uh, our patients so it's very difficult to analyze long term data with this kind of patients and so we've lost most of our patients uh, who have just given up these kind of therapies for us but we are we are confident about the fact that now we have uh, so many new uh, arenas opening up in in nephrology onconephrology especially with different monoclonal antibodies coming up that uh, i i think a extra corporeal has probably taken the back seat for the meantime i had a case uh, i had a case where we uh, a patient with light chain cast nephropathy uh, for two months on dialysis and we did a high cut of uh, dialysis for this patient uh, two sessions and she uh, i i cannot say that that was the only thing that has contributed to the recovery but the chemotherapy and this together she is now maintaining at around 1.5 creatinine of dialysis so there are some cases as like where we can see some dramatic response but definitely depends on the chronicity and other factors how much yes, deep yeah dr krishna i should congratulate you for that patient that's you that you've been able to use high cut of dialysis and high cut of dialysis for for the patient but uh, unfortunately uh, we haven't seen anything of this sort with just two sessions and we would i i, I would actually attribute it to to the to existing treatment the pre existing treatment that this patient has had on and we've seen uh, remarkable responses in our patients even up to 6 months or maybe even after 9 months of complete sure. remission and Absolutely. patients coming back to us with uh, an absolutely normal creatinine and these are patients who presented to us with rapidly progressive renal failure so that's the kind of uh, dramatic response that you see when you have uh, complete remission attributing it to extra corporeal is uh, with just two sessions i don't know thank you thank you so much dr vinan thank you so much and uh, my next question is to dr anila madam good evening hello hi 
So uh, as you could see the case, uh, the kidney biopsy was delayed by almost four weeks because the patient was on antiplatelets, patient has a coronary event. So the diagnosis of crescentic GN came after four weeks of the insult. Okay. So do you see any possibility of having a urinary biomarkers that would help us during that period where the biopsy is not possible? Do you see the liquid biopsy coming again in vogue or we need to rely on some novel methods of doing biopsy like a transjugular biopsy um, going for when patient is on antiplatelets or with some coagulation? What is your take on it? Like uh, how are we going to get prevented and prevent that four weeks of period from not taking a decision on the patient? Yeah, that's something that's completely out of my field because I report only in biopsies. I don't do any liquid-based or biurinary biomarkers. Right. So I really wouldn't be able to answer your question on that. Yeah, um, I can take that. I can yeah, take that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so um, that's that's a very interesting question, actually. You see, what happens is that this is the kind of scenario that we see patients on uh, dual uh, antiplatelet agents, and they come to you, and you and you don't know what exactly to, to do with these patients. Unfortunately, we do not have we've reviewed the literature. We do not have any significant biomarker that can replace a kidney biopsy. Absolutely. And now we have substantial data that. If you are off your uh, anti, if you're off clopidogrel, you can do a biopsy even on aspirin as as long as you use an 18 gauge uh, gun and you use an ultrasound guidance, uh, provided the fact that you do it with the guidance, and uh, you have newer methods now to do biopsies like the coaxial gun. You also have a, uh, you have specialized glues that you can form a tract with, and then you can which is called the DVC glue, uh, which can actually just uh, be applied to the point of insertion and that creates a tunnel and so the bleeding just stays just about in that point. So these are for highest patients. So the threshold to biopsy a patient who has a clinical diagnosis of RPGN I think should be very low because the earlier you diagnose the earlier you treat. That, that's perfect. So uh, whenever you are in doubt whether to do a biopsy or not we biopsy. It's... That should be the first commandment of uh, today's talk, I think. So, uh, Dr. Anila, coming back to you, uh, do, do you do you see any particular time frame where which is very crucial to make a diagnosis in such cases? What Dr. Uh, Krishna Patil presented. What would be your ideal time to do a biopsy? Would you suggest something on that? Yeah, see, uh, the ideal time of the biopsy is something that uh, we really a pathologist cannot. Uh, do dictate because invariably if the biopsy is late we know it's due to some of the reasons that you uh, previously mentioned but a uh, crescentic gn uh, the earlier you biopsy obviously the better because uh, we hardly get serial biopsies to know at what time a cellular crescent becomes a fibrocellular or a fibrous crescent so if you can pick it up at the cellular stage, yes, you can treat it. But once the crescent has progressed on to a fibrous crescent, there is, it's an irreversible damage. So uh, that is one. And uh, if I may just add something to what Dr. Radhika has already described, I mean, she's done an excellent uh, presentation there. One thing that this case really highlights is the importance of doing both kappa and lambda light chains on all biopsies. Okay, it's uh, uh, unfortunate that even now we are almost moving to 2024, but occasionally I get biopsies for review from other centers or some peripheral centers where they have not done kappa lambda. Absolutely. Uh, kappa lambda, I don't know why, for some reason is done selectively on like how we do Congo red, right? We don't do Congo red in every state. They do it on cases like kappa lambda by some specialists is still uh, being done only when you're suspecting myeloma or only when you see cars or when you see a myeloid. But you need to remember that kappa and lambda have to be done on every single case. So this, from the pathologist part, I would like this to be the take home message for all the nephrologists uh, here so that you communicate with your pathologist and ensure that irrespective of the clinical presentation, irrespective of the my, light microscopic and the IF presentation, you do both the kappa and the lambda chain, light chains, because a diagnosis of PGN-MID can never be made otherwise. 
<laughs> that is one. And the second thing, uh, by definition, PG and MID has to show IgG uh, subtype restriction. Like it is by definition IgG3 or rarely it could be IgG1. I'm not aware of many centers in our country which do IgG subtyping. Probably Dr. Alok is here and um, he does it. But otherwise, by and large, we depend, we make a diagnosis on PG and MID by ruling out the other possibilities of with light chain restriction. So that's another thing that probably in the future we would be doing subtyping more often and in more cases. But light chain uh, definitely without a doubt should be done on every renal biopsy. Because PG and MID, the age range is from five years to 80 years. A child of five years, you may just see the light microscopy and call it as a post-infectious GN or an MPGN immune complex type. Had you not done Kappa Lambda, the whole diagnosis changes. So that's a take home message from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you. That was a great, uh, that was a great understanding. Uh, at this point, I would like to involve uh, Dr. Uh, Urmila Anand, madam. Uh, so, uh, uh, madam is there? Or? I couldn't yeah, see. But I have no voice. So, I think Vinand can take care. I have a very bad throat. Oh, no, no problem. Please, please take care. You just please listen, listen, to, the listen to what me and Vinan Just the one now. comment I would like to make yes, on uh, the talk. See, the rule of thirds for membranous actually does not applicable nowadays. With okay. Dr. Vivek Jha's uh, randomized control trial as late as 2007 or 8, I mean, as early as yes, 2007 yes. in yes. Jackson yes. showed only 10% of membranous actually progressed to end stage. If yes. you treat them, the rule of thirds is only applicable to untreated membranous. Yeah. So that is something we ought to understand that. So I just wanted her to. And the second was FSGS, please. I think Dr. Anla will also agree, is not a disease anymore. Yeah. It is a cytothea pattern. Absolutely. And, and the can... Columbia classification is not, no longer in vogue. Yeah. We the don't uh, now it's like a primary be... FSGS or a secondary FSGS yeah. or a genetic uh, disease associated FSGS. Yeah, because that Columbia classification is not there anymore. And I think Madam will be able to tell you the more diffuse the photocytopathy, more chances of it being primary. Primary, yes, yes. definitely. Thank you. Uh, so I think, I'm... please go ahead. Uh, my clinical colleagues will take care, but I'm there. Yeah, yeah. So, madam, just please listen to what we discuss and just correct us wherever we go wrong. Actually, I'm listening to that. And <laughs> Dr. Anila is also there. So, so Vinant, see, uh, after all this talk, we have identified two knowledge gaps. That's all, it's all about. So, we identified first knowledge gap as we don't know when and how and for how long to remove the extracorporeal substances in a patient with paraproteinemia or plasma cell dyscrasia, one. Second thing, we have not yet identified uh, uh, a substance uh, in the biopsy tissue in the histopathology or in the urine or in the serum that will tell us the activity of the disease. So do you think such kind of knowledge gaps will be bridged if we float in a glomerular registry across the country or at multiple centers in the country and do we get some answers out of it how do you what are your tips to like uh, go about it like i would like to hear yeah, thank you sir that's a very interesting question in fact i was thinking of uh, discussing about that maybe if you could give me some time so the first thing is that we do have a couple of molecules which are moving around you know they're doing the creating some ripples about the disease. Uh, one, obviously, is that uh, the PLATO receptor antibody, as yeah, we can detect them in the serum. That's one thing. And the second, which is very interesting, is uh, the role of uh, galactose-deficient IgA, which has been seen now in patients with uh, IgA nephropathy. In fact, we have a couple of uh, studies which will be coming out from CMC Valor, I think, because they're doing some work on, uh, the, on this particular molecule. And I was told that one of these uh, one of these students and one of the PhD students has been involved in this work. So we'll, we'll be looking forward to some kind of data that comes from Indian subcontinent uh, regarding the role of uh, this particular molecule, which is galactose, galactose uh, deficient IgA as well as uh, I, IgA and G uh, uh, immune complex formation. 
So these are two things that could be uh, of interest uh, when we are generating some amount of data. But all of this is uh, actually just an infancy. So I, I totally go with what uh, Dr. Monde has to say, Dr. Suhas Monde, that we have to start from somewhere. So the start has to be something which is very uh, easy to do and should be very practical for everybody so that a lot of people participate in the club in the, in the registry. Uh, rather than complicating issues and making it tough, uh, I think it's best that we make it very simple so that he's very clearly told us uh, that I think that's the way it should be done. And we're not too far away from generating our own uh, glomerulonephritis uh, or glomerular disease data. And I'm sure that this group is going to be a very helpful partner in uh, allowing us to collate all the data from the rest of different parts of this country and get it into one form. Absolutely. So I think we have actually overshot our um, uh, time schedule. So uh, if there are any questions from the house, they are welcome in just five minutes or uh, we can just uh, take leave for the next first Friday of every month. Uh, Simaji, any questions in your chat box? I think we have a few comments from... Uh... MK. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I am Mudu Kumar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Dr. Mudu. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Actually, uh, actually, I have been, I have been knowing Krishna Patel, and we were. Uh, I can share my thoughts on this, uh, this uh, the way of conducting and registry. That's uh, basically the, the crux of today's meeting, I suppose. And uh, this is a good initiative, and it has we. We, there was a group which was formed in like an uh, young nephrology association. Like it is comes under ISN only, ISN Indian Society of Nephrology, uh, uh, young ne nephrology association. So uh, that meeting happened in the year of 2017, and we conducted the meeting. Nephrologists are always young, Mutu. Yeah, that's fine. Sir. So that's that the they 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 like minimize the age to 40. So we took part in registry. I was presenting the same like uh, who was. So as was presenting now, a small registry from Australia, which has brought data on their own simple, simple questions like aspirin, statins, many, many, many more. Like uh, uh, then what happened? Then it became something and an electoral group which was associated with uh, some politi political things. Then then research could not come up. So then I, at that time I was in private. We know that the disadvantages of conducting research in private sectors. Although Dr. Vinant and others are doing it perfectly. And then when I moved to a government sector, we proposed last year five proposals of making a registry that like uh, Indian Glomerular Nephritis Consortium. That was the name which was given. And that was uh, that I took what I took was I took the mentorship of uh, a senior nephrologist, uh, like senior in terms of experience. And uh, and uh, I tried to want to bridge as an act as a bridge to bring in some people who are working in an education institutes and academic institutes, a lot of DNB institutes. So we could contact from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, we have around 25 centers. And uh, uh, because IGA are, are, take, are working like work by Dr. Uh, uh, Susina and CMC and Dr. Uh, Bakshi ma'am and uh, Ames and few others are working on it. And we, I wrote a proposal on this, particularly on MCD FSGS, common questions which we daily ask in for like we don't know many things on that but we do we do it without much of evidence and then uh, uh mgrs like which we spoke uh, because last year isn the number of posters on mgrs was very high and then the leading paper was on around 13 case series 13 patients case series so it's a good move like uh, wherever you need and support from others will be into it. And it's a good move, actually. If you want to uh, do a uh, registry, then we can bring in some data with uh, uh, nephrotics, including genetics. That's right. And uh, such kind of uh, meetings will really be helpful. Uh, but uh, it has to be like Dr. Vinant actually is a superpower now. And uh, he can help us in conducting a very good registry because we need to find answers for our questions. Yes, because yes, there are so absolutely. many things which like some some beautifully respond to some therapy. He may not that can may not be like an umbrella therapy for everybody. As usual, Dr. Anila, ma'am, I used to disturb her a lot when I was there in Velour. Uh, nice meeting you, ma'am, and others. It's a very good initiative. Please continue doing this. It's a continuous effort wherever you input from all the things which I have done. 
already if you want i can like explain it so that you have a difficulties can be you can take over that and make a good registry that is very much important and it's a potential thing like the potential thing is yeah. the uh, the the group actually so you know when we started it the people were initially were interested then it's very difficult to collect data then giving data getting in concern becomes a difficulty so yeah. all those things are so much difficulties which will come at least i expect a common question with a small peer group uh, is also a meaning will also become meaningful in due course the other thing is the quality of reporting i think anila ma'am and radhika ma'am all those uh, senior guys will train the younger uh, people and uh, uh, that's uh, that's great uh, uh, because there are no new labs are coming up new people are doing in nephropathology so sometimes very difficult to uh, get a right, right thing out of them although they are do, doing a great job so all the best for this group and so it should be an excellent uh, uh, for uh, like a group which will take something uh, for futuristic and we will have data from our own country and particularly involving every other nephrologists who are interested in academics thank you so not much. only an uh, it's not be an uh, institute based or academic yeah. center based whoever want to collaborate they should be invited to collaborate absolutely more thank than you. Very thank more you thank you sir it's more than encouragement that was i was needed so thank you so much hats off to your efforts i discussed with even dr rajapurkar sir he was joined for this same uh, seminar for today uh, unfortunately he left but he also mentioned that it's is the way it will be you will be starting you will be failing and then again you will be coming with some all like group and like with the similar minded people who want to have some good registry and good data to be collected for the country so thank you so much and we'll keep in contact for sure so seema ji uh, uh, i need permissions from all the panelists dr vinant dr anila and uh, dr ribla anand madam to uh, conclude this interesting talk interesting discussions so thank you thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you so much thank you so much seema ji all over to you very thank you very much, much. thank you thank you to all the esteemed panelists and uh, to thank you so much dr suhas and dr purvi ma'am so i think uh, there are no more questions in fact we have some uh, comments that of course it's a great session and great discussion indeed so congratulations to the organizers so so with this uh, we are then uh, closing the session for today and we are looking forward to meeting you all again next month uh, in the first week of uh, friday the first friday of the month Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good, Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.